Welcome everybody, uh, I'm Dr Angela Katwa, I am the engagement lead for Wessex Museums and I'm delighted to welcome you to the third lecture that's part of our Wildlife in the Red series this evening. So just to introduce our speaker this evening, we're so delighted to have you here, Arjun. He, Arjun is an 18 year old nature lover from South London. He's currently in his final year of A-levels. After becoming a volunteer for the National Trust when he was 14, his involvement in creating better opportunities for young people to interact with nature has helped him work with a range of organisations. He has been an ambassador for the hashtag I Will campaign and has sat on the youth panel for the London Wildlife Trust. And this was also whilst working as an ambassador for the Cameron Bespoke Trust. And he's also a member of the BTO and Youth Advisory Panel. In addition to his current environmental work, his love, his love for bird sound has encouraged him to help set up a new project, which aims to promote the importance of sound to mental health and conservation. I mean, that is a phenomenal introduction and a range of achievements for someone who's only 18 years old. Um, but over to you, Arjun. Um, if you want to take yourself off mic, you can happy to share the screen. We're going to hand it over to you. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're well in these kind of strange, difficult, and until today, freezing cold times. I mean, I'm really looking forward to the spring now. But firstly, I'd like to thank Angela, Angela and Zara as well for kindly inviting me to talk to you today about my love for wildlife, conservation, and why being involved in the environmental sector is just such a cool thing to be involved in. So a little bit about me, uh, I've already been given such a wonderful uh, intro by Angela there, but just to go back to that, I've recently turned 18, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, and despite a lockdown birthday, I was able to spend it quite nicely. Uh, at the moment, I'm currently studying my A-levels and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that uh, by the end of the year, I'll be able to go and study music and geography at university, where I'm not sure yet, but fingers crossed I'll know in the near future. So for my entire life, I've always been very much outdoorsy kind of person. Just love being outside and just, it just feels right. All sorts of sports, cricket especially, that just, that's what, what I love to do. And I think because of that, I want to be outside all the time. That's what really sparked my love for nature, kind of that core inside of me. So at the moment, as Anjan has said, I'm currently a volunteer for the National Trust and I have been since I was 14. Uh, 2019 was almost my big year. That's really where I got started. And, since then, I've, become, I've been an ambassador to the Canberra Sport Trust for nearly two years, uh, BTO Youth Advisory Panel for just over a year, and as well, I think most of all, the National Trust, which was really my uh, entrance into the conservation world. As well as this, I've been uh, part, part of the I Will campaign, which has sadly, unfortunately, finished now, uh, which meant that I had a full year of just unbelievable experiences. And this, in addition, the London Wildlife Trust, which I was on the youth forum for for a year. So that's a little bit about me. So my early days, I think everyone talks about their childhood and having like a role model as their as their way into the conservation world. And I think often it's uh, their parents or family member. For me, my mother was just so crucial because she, I think, probably just got fed up with me listening talking about football and dinosaurs and. Yeah, that despairing mother was the person who kind of inspired me to do the Big Garden Birdwatch uh, run by the RSPB every January. And so when I was seven, she kind of gave me an, an old pair of binoculars and said, right, go and, go and look for something. And I ended up having a green woodpecker. And I think that green woodpecker, every time I see it, I think maybe if I hadn't seen one of them that day, I may never have got into birdwatching in the first place. But going on from that a little bit, I think, during my early years of year four and year five, I had a, a school teacher who was birder. And every time he saw something, there was one math lesson, he just decided that if he saw something, he would just point it out to us. And he spotted a sparrowhawk out the window. And he just said, right, everyone to the window. I want to show you the sparrowhawk. Uh, it's a simple bird. Everyone can see at any time, really, just over the garden. But just by doing that, I remember scrambling as fast as I could to get to the window, having never seen a sparrowhawk before. So that year five teacher really initiated what I would say just a passion that I, I know there's no way back on now. So for the, for the months after that, I started a, a school club uh, and the next two years, that school club was great. It got 20 odd people who probably didn't know why, why they were there, except that they were friends with me, but 
that's exactly what I needed then, just to make me feel like caring about nature was really where I belonged. And because of that, I just really just couldn't stop. By year five, we went to India. And that was one of two big trips that kind of grabbed my attention to a new level because going somewhere like in to India where all my origins lie all my family members uh, live and it was just seeing wildlife that you could never imagine seeing here so that really grabbed that really hooked it but more so than that was something like Malaysia in 2015 uh, a norm, normal family holiday kind of revolves around one day of the trip where I get to choose what to do but this trip we were staying at a nice little resort and uh, I just met a man there who, who's a naturalist and he kind of adopted me for a few days and I think a lot of young people that are interested in nature and wildlife will often talk about role models as I've already mentioned. He was a real role model to me because he didn't really know that, I, he didn't really care that I was 12 and didn't really know anything about wildlife at the time. He could see I really cared about it and so for three, four days that trip he took me out and showed me all sorts of wildlife that I just would never have imagined seeing here obviously but even there being someone who was 12 I was just mind blown to see things like great hornbills and sunbirds and I know I talk about it a lot with a lot of my friends who just get a bit irritated with me if anything but something like seeing those kind of things with the guys really really inspired me more than anything which is where the appreciate appreciating the natural world suddenly turned into a lot of the environment and conservation as a whole because even though it was better wildlife something like seeing hornbills you're not going to see them here it was kind of showing me that actually if I'm going to love wildlife all over the globe I need to appreciate the wildlife in my garden everywhere at home as well. So Malaysia really started something that was a love for what British wildlife and I think finding a patch was what I decided to do when I got back home after 2015. The next few years I just carried on with my bird watching, carried on with wildlife watching and I started to look at local places that I, I felt most of all happy safe and just really like a second home if anything uh, and Morton Hall Park considering I'm based in South London is very close to me it's about 15 minute uh, 15 minute drive half an hour by bus and as I was getting older I was allowed to use uh, public transport more which was great really um, and that was just such a good start I think the National Trust has done an amazing job at Morton Hall Park they've made it so much more accessible for people uh, and or it was a little bit unsafe and it was kind of where yeah not not somewhere you'd want to go to really so when I came back and I started looking somewhere it just seemed so perfect so by 2017 I kind of settled here and I started to really really love going there it was one of those places like once a week I was like mum can we go to Morning Hall Park and it was always a yes because we'd always we'd, we'd always wanted to get out the hall. it was like a, a weekly thing just wanting to get out for a local walk so as I went on, it just became second home. So in addition to the weekend visits to photography, I think what I often say is 2015 was where I almost developed this environmental conscience. It sounds a little bit silly, but it was where I was almost thinking, I can't really just, well, having seen deforestation, mangrove loss in Malaysia, such active problems that wildlife in the world is facing, I just found it very difficult to sit there thinking, Oh, I love wildlife, but I can just sit here and, you know, I can just be happy without wanting to protect the things I love at a place I've grown to love. So the influence of Malaysia was making me realise that if I'm going to love wildlife, I can't just sit here and think wildlife and British wildlife and photography is it. Conservation and actually protecting the things I love, that was where I wanted to go into. That was kind of my route into the conservation world. So I think that's where volunteering and National Trust just became basically the main thing I started to do. Uh, I think one second, oops, screen has frozen. There we go. So yeah, Duke of Edinburgh is something that the reason I started to look at volunteering specifically. Duke of Edinburgh award, for those that don't know, is uh, every year there's bronze, silver and gold and our school started it in year, year 10. Uh, and in order to complete this award, of bronze alone, which is the first award, you have to complete six months of volunteering. Uh, that can be all sorts of things, such as working in a bookshop or a library. But for those who like being outdoors and like sports, and in fact, anyone really, something like conservation and getting involved with nature is what the, what the Duke of Edinburgh Award encourages. 
So suddenly I was thinking, right, not only do I want to give back to the local area and the local wildlife and protect them from somewhere I really love, but I also have to do it. So that's a really good spark for young people who might not otherwise have been interested in nature beforehand. So what I did then was just email, just someone at the National Trust saying, right, have you got anywhere that I can come volunteering? Kind of fully expecting them to say, no, we haven't got anything, uh, you're gonna have to go look elsewhere. But after about five emails of very helpful people, I signed up to the Young Ranger program called the Urban Ranger. Uh, not only was this for 11 to 24 year olds specifically, but it was run by several, uh, several people, fairly young, who wanted, who probably knew a few years before that there was no opportunity within the National Trust for young people. It was very difficult to find the opportunity that most young people would like. So, the, the result of this was them asking me if I wanted to join and there I was a week later having never done any sort of conservation before, never thought I could really, plunged into the, con into the conservation world. But more so than this is that not only did I go to a session, a session indoors with it raining heavily in January, a week later I found myself in Brown Sea Island because they had they'd organised a trip for the previous urban rangers and having never met them at all they invited me. So I was just like in heaven there. It's, it's one of the nicest places in the southeast. It's so good for wildlife and so good for conservation. So one of the best things about it uh, are the red squirrels. So I've never seen a red squirrel before. So being able to go there was just like, oh, was just, yeah, I was just complete heaven. I was loving it, even if it was raining in heaven for two days. I think the thing that struck me the most about suddenly finding myself with this conservation nature community having always been birding by myself before or watching wildlife by myself is how welcoming they all are. Uh, so the five, the four people I would mention are Hattie, Hilary McGrady, who's the um, Director General of the National Trust, Dave Coughlin and Richard Newman. All of them work at the National Trust, but they just made me feel so at home. And I think if anyone is looking to get into the conservation world as a young person, they don't really want to feel out of place. And I definitely didn't want to. I didn't want to feel uncomfortable at all. So hands down, I'd say wildlife and community, conservation community is just the best out there because for that entire trip, I just felt like I'd known them for such a long time, whether I was playing board games or going on doing these orienteering quizzes and just letting me go birding, really, if anything. That was so much fun. And I think fun is the reason why people want to do things as a young person. That's what exactly what it was made for me, even if I was getting up at stupid o'clock to go and look at a, wet, a rare seagull or something. Uh, but I think beyond all that, there's always going to be some opportunity that for someone who likes the environment more than just a bit of local volunteering, which is so good as well, is kind of the professional opportunity that you're getting as a young person that nowhere else can really offer at all. In addition to funny stories, such as like in my second session, I ended up planting a whole 20 trees upside down because I didn't really ever see what I was doing. But or, I don't know, even standing in a bowl for a photo shoot a year later, there have been some serious, serious things that I've done that I know are making a difference. And I know that I, most other people my age, when I did them, there's no chance they would have had such opportunities, which is where the conservation world is so great, really. So this includes the Time Is Now conference, uh, which I completed in 2019 in June of my GCSEs, where I went into London to speak to MPs about kind of involving more young people in their decisions about local, so local decisions about the environment. That was kind of my first opportunity that I did with the National Trust. I then started to work on a podcast with them. I attended Bent Hills and Bird Fair, which is a big event every year, but well, most years in um, at Rutland Water, uh, representing them there, so volunteering. Uh, I then wrote an article. Uh, for their 150th anniversary about mental health and the benefits of bird watching there and fun palaces is another another event every year that's run uh, in october where it, it's a community thing so getting young people especially involved with activities outdoors out, out of heart which is more than one in my case and it's just beyond anything it's just such a great opportunity to just have a good laugh and meet other people that have similar interest to you so to finish there though, the biggest of all, the biggest thing I've probably done, and one of the biggest things I've ever done ever was Country Bar Live because I'd never been involved with anything really that I thought, oh, all these inspirational people that are kind of 
more experienced than me. I want to do something like that. And Country Bowl Live, I was representing the National Trust at an event on a panel with some seriously like, famous people, really. And you had, as well as Hilary McGrady, who's the Director General, as previously mentioned, there was Richard Walker, who's the Managing Director of Iceland, and Lord Nicholas Stern, who's an economist and the chair, and chair of the Grantham Institute, which is the Centre for Climate Change and Economics. Uh, and sitting alongside me on the panel of young people was Bella Lapp and Dara McAnulty. I think doing something like that, I had never done anything like it before. I was terrified that last night. I didn't really eat very much. I was kind of shivering for most of it, and that wasn't because I was feeling cold. Uh, and it was getting up at 7.30 a.m. that day. It just felt overwhelming, and I just I was like, this is, I was so out of, so far out of my comfort zone. But once again, the National Trust, someone like Hilary McGrady, who I sat with in chapter two that evening, she was really helpful. I would just, I, I'd never really met her before, and she was just like, oh, it's all right, you're gonna be great. I've seen what you've done. I'd see that I've kind of followed your work. You're gonna be fine. And just that reassurance from a role model who I, I continue to meet every now and then, that's where the National Trust has kind of given me a platform that I would never have thought of before. So after the National Trust, I think that was where I suddenly thought, okay, social media, there's going to be a lot on there that I'm probably missing out on. I, I'd always been a little bit lacking in confidence, but I always thought, okay, I'm definitely not going to get Instagram because I'm no, no chance I'm going to be posting pictures about, about myself because why would I want to do that? Uh, there's no, yeah, there's nothing really on Instagram or Snapchat, and I don't really want to talk to other people when I'm at home like that. So, oh, you know what, maybe I'll just go with Twitter. There's lots of bird watchers and older people on there that might be able to help me. So I started with that, and I just kind of thought, maybe a few weeks later, if I didn't like it, I'd delete it. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was just like, I was loving it, really. I think it was, the initial hesitance was overdone with growing confidence and posting things I've seen or saying or identifying birds. And I just found this like wildlife community. And a lot of, I think a lot of people that are watching today will probably agree with me that the Twitter community is pretty welcoming. At times there can be an argument or something, but it's on the whole so positive because it helps young people kind of have a platform for bird watching nature, especially that meeting new friends so easy that you can just do whatever you want on there and you can just grow in confidence. And I think that's where Twitter really helped me develop my skills as a young person interested in nature. So a few, by a few months in, I've started to talk to more people. I've kind of got over the initial fears a little bit more and I've met I've met, met new people in the sense of I've spoken to more people in direct messages. It was a case of, I knew these people were very similar to me. Uh, so by a few months in, it was starting to think, okay, I'd quite like to meet some of these people. So first met the first few people in July, uh, having got it in the, Feb in the February of that same year. And then myself and, and a good friend, Samuel Levy, we organized the Young Birdies Walk in London for anyone interested in nature under the age of 18. Uh, in August 2018. I think it was something that we just thought might be a good opportunity just to talk to people and just go bird watching. I think bird watching there was the kind of primary, the main reason we'd organised it, but I don't think we, any of us thought uh, what it would turn into in the months going onwards. So these youth engagement young birders walks, I, that's what we've now renamed them, but that's what we originally started with training young birds walks for people in London. I think the initial thing that we thought was we were amazed to find so many young people with shared interests in and around London. When I first got Twitter, I thought I was kind of this lone weirdo that just likes going bird watching and there was no chance anyone would be like me. But suddenly you find that there is a community of people that actually are looking to do exactly the same as you, appreciate wildlife, really love conservation, but also want to meet new, new people that share these interests. Although we started with a London focus, uh, which was set at Rain and Marshes, which is in kind of the, near the Thames estuary, it, we're definitely hoping to make this more kind of global thing because uh, it's not just based around London, because I think people often think that everything is always around London. But going forward, we're hoping to expand that a little bit more. But to start with, Rain and Marshes is probably somewhere where I've had some of my happiest memories now in the last three years. Although we've not been able to have a walk since January 2020 because of uh, because of COVID. It's something we're hoping to go for more in the future. But the last time I basically went there was the last time I actually met any friends that I now call uh, kind of young birders friends or just my best mates essentially. And that was in 
uh, my good friend Sam and Sean at Random Last October. And that was just that was just probably one of the best days I've had in the last year because there's been so little happening. But well, not just that, because it was just an awesome day. And actually, I think all of us felt better for it, not just because the bird watching quality was good, but because we actually got to see people again, seeing people that are just really great people. And that's where the nature community is just kind of constantly there for you. And that's why I've, I've never stopped loving them. But ever since then, uh, that original start back in August 2018, we've had four further walks. Uh, we had three in 2019, all of which were just really good because they grew each time. Our first walk had five young people. By the end, we were reached in 13 or 14. And not only this, we were trying to cover as many people from different ethnicities, genders as possible. And the fact that by the end, we got introduced a few more people from uh, so Asian backgrounds, a few people from, uh, yeah, just a big range of people, essentially. And I think that's where that's something going forward I'll talk about a bit later on as diversity is something that I very much have really cared for. Uh, as well as these walks, you're always looking kind of for a good laugh. I've managed to completely mess up a few times. So the one time I handed, I, I took over the range of actually leading the walk from Sam, who's basically a mature, much, much, much more mature person than the two of us. Uh, one time I took over, it was just a complete disaster. There was horrendous weather, people lost their phones, someone got lost. So uh, I think we've both completed our stick to the organisation side. Uh, but in summary, I think the reason we find these so enjoyable is just a big range of reasons. When you're answering the question, making conservation cool, is that kind of trying to say that anyone can be involved with it? I think between that group, you've got people who are sportsmen and sportswomen, you've got people who play music for a semi-professional degree. You've just got a big range of interesting people that appreciate wildlife and just want to care for it, but want to share their love for it with other people. And I think between all of us now, we're all getting involved with the environmental sector in different ways, whether that's through blogs or through writing, or maybe it's just passion, that's, that's a hobby rather than uh, what's something that people want to go into professionally. Even so, I think mental health there is what really brings us together in a weird way. While we've all got things in common, which means we can make friends, we all benefit from something when like during difficult times, we can all just kind of switch off a little bit and just with a group of people you share interests with and just appreciate wildlife in the best form in London. So leading on to this, I think social media and kind of the social opportunities offered by the conservation world is where moving forward, there's probably never been a better time to be a young person. I think 10 years ago, often I've had bird watchers that are older than me or people or conservationists say, oh, I wish I was your age now because I'd never have had such opportunities, getting involved in national trust, working with organisations. I'd never been able to do that before. So that is such a big thing in kind of creating uh, a community that basically we can all love. So to set, let's talk about a little bit about some of the opportunities. As I mentioned before, Bird Fair is a great place for all of us to come together, uh, whether that's an interest in birds specifically, but that can also be interesting kind of insects and Plants, all of us, it just it's kind of a sense of unity and real life opportunities are so, are so much better than online opportunities. We're just hoping that we can all kind of get back and meeting each other again soon. Now, I think it's a little bit kind of cringy thing to say, uh, I'll dare I say that, but I recently met Prince Charles and said uh, the Twitter community that I've met have just led me to kind of finding friends that just feel like a big wider family, uh, which I think. Uh, I actually will, I stand by that because some of the friends I've made from it, as you can see in the top right picture, it was my 17th birthday, spending it with people that I share an interest with and all love wildlife conservation. It's just, it was just like it's probably the best birthday I've ever had easily because it was a real life event and we could all get to do something we love. So WhatsApp is something that most young people seem to have. Uh, I definitely do and I basically rely on it. But there's so many different group chats available now that people who have an interest in all sorts of things, whether that's moths and butterflies or birds and you know conservation, everything, there's an opportunity for everyone to be involved to meet other young people involved with that. So it's almost like you're not gonna be like a lone, like that per, lone person that's got this interest and no one else does. There's so many places that you can go to that you're thinking, okay, right, I'm never gonna be alone in this, even if I'm going bird watching for an hour by myself. I can at least come back to it 
uh, and knowing that maybe people might be interested to know what I've seen or you can share sightings or you can find you can, other people can help you identify uh, what you see. So that kind of sense of unity is just definitely something that going forward, I think social media and Twitter especially is going to be important just so then young people know that they're not alone liking slightly different things. So moving on to one of the organisations I've kind of always worked with, I've worked for such a long time now that feels like just yet, as I said, for another slightly wider family in the Camerons Folk Trust. A little bit about their background. Um, loving memory of uh, Cameron Volker, uh, following his tragic death in 2013, his family set up the trust to try and kind of give other young people the opportunity to, yeah, the opportunity to get involved with nature that most young people would never have had before. And although they've been uh, involved in 2013, uh, the trust centres around a group of trustees and 12 young ambassadors. All of us are kind of between the ages of 15 and 24, and we're just trying to find ways that other young people can get engaged with nature, as our motto is bringing children and nature together. One of the best things about us is that we all love nature in different ways. With our interest ranging from conservation or wilding, gardening and environmental campaigning, there's just room for making opportunities for everyone. And I think that's where the trust works so well together. We all complement each other. And I think going forward, everyone that we kind of work with, they always want to know more. They always want to know what we're doing as young people to bring action for conservation. So I think some of the events we some of the events that we help sponsor uh, include um, obviously our London Young Birders Walks, which we now call the Bog Walks for Wildlife. Uh, giving out badges to the young people that attend, and talking about the trust, uh, sponsoring uh, BTO bird camps, and once a year, a lucky person gets to go to Cornell in America. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on from where I left off about Cameron's Cottage. Uh, as you can see in the bottom right, it's a very grand place. Uh, it's right in the heart of the new forest, and it's aiming to provide a base to inspire young people to experience nature, basically in the best form. Uh, having charged 425,000 towards the project, we're hoping to get it completed by October this year. So if anyone is interested and wants to find out more, please follow us on social media and help sponsor us. It would be really appreciated. So the next organisation that I'll talk about is BTO, the British Trust for Ecology. I've been involved with basically ever since 2019, where I had some of the best five days of my life at Spurn in East Yorkshire. Uh, since then, I've become part of their youth advisory panel, which was advised at the end of 2019 to, to give 10 young people the chance to have a role in policy uh, within the within February 2020, uh, where I got to see all uh, most of the uh, other nine uh, panelists. Uh, we've had good fun basically just trying to get trying to find ways of engaging more young people with conservation and bird watching so that they can almost use their own experiences and get, have the opportunities to basically develop that going forward. So by doing this, we've got uh, four main um, four main targets. One is the youth representative scheme, which we've now succeeded with. Uh, as of November 2020, we've got 15 young uh, youth representatives, hopefully uh, making a huge, well, definitely making a huge difference so far, and hopefully they'll continue to do, to do so by leading walks and events. Then we've also got the, the idea of uh, carrying out training resources. So uh, by means of this, we kind of want to help young people have necessary equipment to go forward and have the opportunities to get involved with uh, kind of training. So BT, that, could, that could be ringing, that could be surveys, all sorts of different things there. Another thing, online content for young people to learn from. Uh, obviously, social media and the internet now is such a useful resource for helping young people kind of develop their skills. So online content is another huge thing that can be uh, used to support young people. And finally, supporting schools and unis through resources as well. So schools and unis, obviously, such a huge way that young people get involved and find the inspiration uh, in the conservation world. And making things, making it cool is just by being there to kind of give them the opportunities for them to try it really beyond anything else, because that's really what got me involved.
Now, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit different, and this is really kind of going back to answering the question about making conservation cool. Sound for me has always been something I've loved, just ever since I was small. I've always loved music. My kind of taste in rock music is not shared by many people, unfortunately, but I've always loved music. And I think since the start of lockdown, I suddenly thought, right now I've got a lot more time. I'm going to get myself a recorder, having been told to by two birders, and I'm going to try this thing called knock me. Uh, not big is nocturnal migration and it refers to how birds fly over at night and making different calls because they're migrating so by putting a recorder and microphone in the garden i've been monitoring birds so that's got a huge contribution to science above anything else but also it's just helped me develop my skills as someone who loves sound and loves nature in that way so some of the birds i've had flying over include things like brent geese and waders and rare birds such as water and snow bunting um, and even if it means sometimes I'm kind of standing out in the cold, which might not be the coolest thing to do, knowing that it's contributing to science specifically is where I think a lot of people think birds isn't just about science, it's more about just going bird watching. Well, actually, there's so much about this that is about science. Sound in general to me is kind of this peaceful, therapeutic, and underappreciated way of, of loving that, the natural world. I've always loved it. And as, as I said, it's kind of brings you this mindfulness. So it stops you thinking beyond other, other things. So if I've got a stressful week at school and I've had a lot of work to do, knowing that I can kind of go back to it and just uh, close my eyes and just take a step back. That's one reason why I like it. I think the benefits to science, as I mentioned before, knowing that every record I kind of submit to an account called Dino Canto, you, uh, you can see my profile there. Uh, knowing that it's going for citizen science and it's actually contributing to something in the natural world more broadly, that is something which, which I also love. For those that might be interested in something like this, the top diagram in the right hand corner, uh, that is kind of showing a geology map of the southeast of London, well, my area of London, and the arrow is the route that some birds seem to be taking. So it kind of shows something like geography, which, which is basically why, why I went to the university, actually might have a contribution in migration things because Birds seem to more broadly follow this band of chalk uh, across this across the southeast. So some things you'd never have learned, you never never know when it comes to conservation and wildlife, when to stop expecting the unexpected, and that is something that just blew me away because I'm like geology birds never find that link. Now when it comes to migration, I think a lot of people will often um, often kind of overlook it and just think, yeah, birds move around across the UK. But if you look at it in a more broad sense of something like a gold crest, which is the smallest UK bird and weighs I don't know, maybe weights of 20 to the coin, migrates across the North Sea every year uh, to get to the UK. And it does that every year. You're thinking, well, okay, that's awesome. There's no way someone can tell me that is not absolutely awesome and seriously cool because if it wasn't, I don't know what bird watching would be, would be like because there's always something interesting to learn about the science behind birds and that is where conservation and protecting species like that or something like arctic terns which are flying from pole to pole every year or something like swallows which are flying from south africa to here every year you cannot tell me that is not mind-blowingly cool so that is where i think if people use facts like this then they might actually be a lot more interested which is where i want to talk about education a little bit because Although the new natural history GPC is a fantastic starting point for young people going forward, trying to get people around the 14 to 16 mark interested in wildlife again, trying to find a way to make making education kind of a starting point of something more than inspiring people already interested in wildlife, which might be happening around the age of 14, but trying to find new people that might be interested, maybe a few years younger. I think that is going to be really important because if we're going to inspire new young people that might, might never have had an interest before, these 14 may be too late, but that is definitely something that going forward could be a platform to make conservation look cooler. Because if you can tell people these facts about wildlife around that age, that is, that is a really good starting point. The last thing I'll talk about with sound is EPOS, just to give a little shout out to the group I'm working in, as uh, Angela mentioned earlier. Uh, it's made by me and three of my friends, uh, uh, Luke, Joe and Isaac on Twitter. We're essentially trying to help young people, especially for anyone on Twitter, 
and then that means we realize how powerful bird sound is how much it can help with mental health and how much you can science science if you know more about it and actually can identify the birds by sound because that's not easy if you can do that then there's huge positives there for everyone so diversity is something that i think for me especially it's a very personal issue i've grown up here all my life as with my parents and they experience a lot more racism than me and i'm really lucky that now i've got such a supportive community around me always kind of giving that platform always giving me the opportunities and not looking at me for my race and that's why why i could not appreciate that more but although this having said that racism does exist in society and while nature i stress is not a racist hobby, hobby at all the biggest thing that we can do about it is trying to make it more accessible for young people so while i think diversity in the uh, conservation sector uh, addresses race gender socioeconomic background and age and there is definitely a lack of diversity at the moment trying to find a way to tackle that is just so important so i would say there are kind of five five good ways that tackling it and making nature more accessible for young people can be done and i think accessible is the main word there because instead of targeting one audience such as ethnicity trying to make it accessible for everyone regardless that is where i think organizations are doing an ever increasing good job of making it more accessible one of the good ways this can be done i think is through role models as you can see in the top right we've got me and steve Bachel, who has been basically my role model ever since i got uh, involved with just anything really just ever since i grew that love for wildlife i used to watch 7060 kind of obsessively and i think a lot of people would agree with that 7060 was great and being able to meet him was just like a dream come true i remember my legs being shaky shaky than ever before because i was like this is literally my biggest role model here trying to make role models from all sorts of backgrounds whether that's from different, different races and from kind of more 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 women involved i think just trying to get all of that together, more role models, that is where everyone can make it more, it can be more accessible for everyone. David Attenborough, another role model for me, but I'd love to have seen more in the conservation sector, role models from uh, wider ethnicities. And I think going forward, that is where someone like myself, and I'm sure, there are, and I know there are a lot of other young people uh, growing from different uh, races, for example, going forward, that is going to be something that makes it more accessible. As I mentioned before, education is another is another brilliant way to try and make it more accessible for uh, people from different ethnicities, uh, trying to kind of show that it can be for everyone. Every 11 year old has the same opportunities uh, to get involved with conservation by showing how cool it is, how great these opportunities are. If you can do that, then all of a sudden, your opportunities are crucial. So I think I'll finish diversity by just reading this quote out that was said at a BTO meeting when we discussed it. Uh, Matt Lumsdale, who's just become quite a good friend, he said, I find this really interesting is at the end of the day, I just love bird watching. I've never wanted to be seen as anything but a young birder, regardless of my gender, race or background. And I think that kind of epitomizes the overall aim of it all, that everyone has the same opportunities. Everyone can be just seen for what they love rather than judged because of it. At, primary, at, at, at secondary school, I've often felt like judged because of liking bird watching and it's not been the most kind of exciting kind of period of time of my life. But if I can get to a stage where everyone has the same opportunities and everyone can appreciate how cool conservation is, that's where we want to be. So I'll just say, I think, I think the word cool is, is quite a difficult word to kind of summarise, if we're going to be honest, because what makes something cool? I think a lot of the time it's uh, something that other teenagers define as cool, which is something that everyone likes, like football, but that doesn't mean wildlife isn't cool. I think wildlife is absolutely awesome. And natural world, as I said, for something like gold press, that is seriously cool. It's also cool, apparently, to meet people like Prince Charles and Steve Backshaw and attend COP26 ones. But what, what's not cool about just liking nature? I've done some seriously awesome things and I'm really, really lucky, but other people haven't had such opportunities as me. What makes something cool is, to me, what makes something cool is doing something that other people, is taking a risk and that what other people might not think is 
the best thing to do, the most teenage thing to do. It's cooler to stand up for something you really love than kind of just put it aside because you worry what other people will think because of it. The best thing about the community is that everyone has my back and they really think what I'm doing is making a difference and I really believe it too. I'm hoping that uh, in the future I can continue to make a difference but I know I wouldn't be there without the community behind me and as I said earlier, telling Prince Charles it feels like a big family I think was probably one of the cringiest things I've done but I really stand by that and I know that most 18 year olds would only dream of having such opportunities that I have. But I think why care is a difficult question to answer. What, what do young people get out of conservation? What, what does nature get out of it? And what does conservation get out of it? But why is it also so important for the future in our planet going forward? It's a really difficult one because cause is probably not the reason why people like to get into it, conservation. Conservation projects such as protecting curlews or red squirrels on Brown Sea Island, maybe even the biodiversity project. Yeah, most teenagers wouldn't wouldn't see it as cool, and that's fair enough. But changing that perception of where we're going to, going forward, the awareness of the natural world as being something that everyone can get into is where I just I just stand by it. I, I'll never stop loving nature, but I want more young people to, to think exactly the same. With issues like climate change growing ever ever bigger, really something like the chiff chappers in the bottom right that can now survive in the UK basically all year round when before there were much fewer, much fewer of them really. That's not a good thing. And things like raptor persecution, that's not a good thing either. Turtle doves, which are being wiped out now because of humans, none of these are good things at all. But if, if the future is going to be any brighter than it is now, more young people need to care and need to realise that what they're doing is making a difference and what they're doing is actually making the world a better place because humans and nature are all part of the same world. I mean, like it or not, I think we're all part of the same world here, but a lot of people forget that we are. A lot of people think they're almost better than nature and it's just another bird, it's just another kind of beast or something. It's, we're still all part of the big same thing here. So the future of our planet really is in our own hands and the natural world matters. Stressing that to people where nature can heal us as much as we can protect it, that's why I'm going forward. Something like the I Will's quote, Young people aren't just the leaders of tomorrow, but they have the energy and the skills and ideas to improve society and our environment today. That's where all these young people need to realise that we can make a difference in the future, but we can also make a difference now. And caring about something we really, really love, that's not weird. It's cool to, it's cool to care about our planet and the world we live in rather than think we're better than it. It's part of us, really. So it's like really raising that awareness and raising, making it more accessible. That's what we all stand for. So how to get involved? If you've got a young person that's kind of thinking, oh, maybe it is the conservation community for me. Try and get them the opportunity that other young people might not have had before uh, is quite easy now, really. You can start small scale like I did with the big garden bird watch or doing a survey or maybe starting a school club. That's quite a big step. You can start small or you can reach out quite bigger and just go straight into volunteering if you want to give it a go. There's probably, there are absolute tons of like maybe at uh, ornithological societies or just just local parks and councils that always do volunteering for young people reaching out on social media might make might be a spark that you didn't know as might be just re meeting someone that you never thought you'd expect to meet so that's where Duke of Edinburgh can be great as well like for me I just never thought I'd be uh, volunteering for the National Trust and there I was once again I'll stress I'd stress education but I've mentioned a lot of that today so I will probably move on and say thank you for listening. Please feel free to ask any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Ojin. What a, an amazing talk. I felt quite emotional watching that, actually. I'm just going to ask you, would you mind stop sharing your screen and then we can get on to some really good questions that have come in. I mean, brilliant talk, brilliant. I mean, you come across as such a... Su such a warm presenter with so much humility and passion for what you do this is what's really come across this evening 
what there are two questions actually that that have come in um both about the same issue from bridget strawbridge who you should follow or if you don't follow on twitter she's amazing her pic in fact she's a bit like you she's got incredible bird photography and observations that i've been looking at on twitter uh nikki nicholson what they would like to know is your opinion on the natural history gcse that went in for consideration with the government earlier well actually last summer um, do you think, what, what's your opinion on the Natural History GCSE? But also, do you think that is a way to enhance and increase diversity within the subject itself? What's your opinions on that? I think it's a really good starting point. I think the fact that anything at all now is really, really good. Before, there was obviously never this opportunity. So I do think it's a good starting point, but I genuinely think it should have been for a younger audience. I think the age group of around... 10 to 12 is probably the most important uh, because it might be uh, where people uh, haven't had an interest in nature before or, or are kind of moving out of that period of time. So I think there was an article published by Bird Guides in a few years ago that said the age group where people lost interest in wildlife was around the age of 11. Uh, so kind of targeting that audience where everyone's born with like a love for nature or wanting to be outdoors, but so that people don't drop off I would love to have seen education around the 10 to 12 mark, uh, just so that uh, more young people that haven't had an interest in as much before do have that opportunity. I think the age of 14, or for GCSEs, which is natural age for GCSE, uh, will mostly target people that are already interested in wildlife, which is my main concern about it, because I think it would just mean that the same people who already love wildlife and conservation will get involved, which is, yeah, as I said, it's a good start, but definitely going forward, I'd like to have seen something for an earlier age group. When it comes to diversity, I think obviously it's something I care about a lot. I think it is a very good, a very important place uh, to tackle it, but I would say even younger than 10 to 12 is more important. Uh, as a kind of seven year old, I was easily the only person in my school that loved nature, but easily the only person kind of I knew of any sort of uh, Asian background that loved nature. So trying to make it that. Uh, people almost have that mindset age seven when you're quite young and innocent you don't really know too much knowing that you can get involved with nature or something and there's no family issue that pressures on it there's no kind of wider community pressures on it but you can just do something like that and it's encouraged in school and education you can see the opportunities it leads to so that's where I think diversity maybe even earlier than uh, education which would be around the 10 to 12 so yeah, in summary, the Natural History CC is a good start, but I would definitely like to see education a little bit earlier on. Yeah, I think I think I tend to agree with you because I've seen that with my own subject, which is uh, geosciences, is that we tend to lose them by the time we get to GCSE and A level geology, we've lost them, and and that's why you know it, it's tricky to get young people into that. I mean, what I find really interesting about your own story is that I remember my parents and and I grew up in Slough which is a very densely urban area not having that much engagement in nature and I had a very similar experience to you actually I went to Kenya where my parents come from and I walked across an ancient lava flow and that was it I knew I wanted to study geology and that that was the touchstone moment for me I mean had I seen a beautiful bird we'd be like you know we'd be like buddies <laughs> I wouldn't be that scientist but I think those touchstone experiences that you described and that's what really came across to me was the role models you had the teachers you had you know the opportunity to have that experience that opened your eyes to this incredible natural world around you if we can bring that to children who are you know living in deprivation or living in urban areas you know what what do you think? I mean, I did have a question about this. This is where I'm going from. Uh, this is from Kavina. She said, well, what would your piece of advice be for someone who didn't feel safe or welcome in natural spaces? So, for example, if there are carers or parents out there with children and they do want to encourage their young, you know, the young people in their family to get to get interested and passionate about nature, to have that touchstone experience. How would you go about helping that? family or that young person see that nature is for them because obviously we've talked a little bit about what it's like to be a minority in these natural spaces you are absolutely you're isolated but but how do you then counteract that 
It's really difficult because as a young person, I have, I was lucky to have the National Trust on my doorstep. But it's just the fact I could go there in a safe environment and just reach out so easily. I was really lucky. And I think anyone who doesn't have that does have a slight barrier. But looking to kind of reach out is probably the main way. And I think social media, if you're not on it already, something like Twitter and just looking, putting out a tweet saying, I'm based in this area. Are there any local opportunities to me? There'll always be someone who responds. Uh, and I think that's probably where social media, even if I'm not a huge fan of it, if I can just be so divisive, the fact that you've got something like that to reach out to local people, local communities and tag in places and say, ask, even ask a famous person, do you have any ideas who, uh, any ideas who might be interested in this or who might be able to help my kind of daughter who's really interested in this? That's probably the, where I'd say where I want to tackle that the most and that's social media. But I can definitely understand how difficult it would be if you haven't got something at the National Trust or a key organisation running the local park or something. On to a slightly nicer question, actually. <laughs> We've got uh, somebody from the Pool Young Archaeology Club, I think. Uh, I'm not, not sure what the acronym is, but they're the Pool YAC. They would like to know, what is your favourite bird and why? My favourite birds are swift. Uh, so I think most people probably uh, see them in the summer. Uh, they're normally here around the end of April and then they'll leave kind of during August. For me, that always signals a time of a change in time. I'm not a winter person. I feel the cold. I don't like the change in light. I don't like the short daytime hours. And Swift kind of epitomise when things are going to get better. Uh, and for me, it epitomises like a classic sound of summer because they're screaming, screaming Swift is what I kind of love listening to all, all summer when I was playing cricket just at home. Uh, and that's why sound and by sight when they're, they're kind of swirling around you, that's why I love Swift. But I think a lot of other people love various sorts of birds, but I know Swifts are very popular. Great. And so what is, uh, we've got another question here from an anonymous attendee. What is a bird that you would most likely to see in the UK that you haven't seen yet? What's, what's on your top list? You're like, I'm absolutely going to travel 100 miles to go and see that bird if someone, if you hear it on the socials. A very mean question. I think I know probably who asked that one because uh, I've spent so much time trying to see them and haven't so far. Uh, Kitty Wakes. Uh, it's just a basically slightly boring bird you can see anywhere along the coast and it just seems to hate me really there's various videos of me kind of failing to see one thinking I'm getting excited by one and not uh, including one at Spurn a few years ago when people tricked me into seeing one and then I didn't and it got 4.2k views on Twitter so Kitty Works I'd love to see but actually I'm gonna uh, shock everyone here and say the bird I want to see most in the UK is a rare bird and that's a black and white warbler from America I've always loved them. I don't know why, but uh, yeah, when you get, they're very, very rare, but I'd love to see one. Good, great. Well, great answer. Do you know what? I, I don't know much about birds, but I have seen kittiwakes and they were on Skoma Island off the, off the Welsh coast. So I, I got one up, I got one up on it. No, I'm joking. I've never Seriously. seen puffins either. No, I saw puffins as well. It was amazing. I mean, you know, talking to someone who loves a rock. So for me, that was like, wow, there's a bird that and I, I knew it because of the puffin books. So I'm totally not a, a bird spotter, but I've learned so much this evening. So much. It's been brilliant. So, you know, a couple of things I just want to close out with because we're just running over time. I, I think your journey from kind of six, seven year old, you know, where your mum's saying, can you just take this and, you know, just just get on and do this in the garden so I can get some time on my, I mean, that's me right now with homeschooling. But your your journey has been extraordinary and you're still only 18, which which kind of just blows my mind. You, you've had, you know, that support, that initial um, kind of joyous moment of I love nature and this is for me. And then having those teachers and role models and and what I found about your journey as well is you've actively sought out the opportunities so where, you know, where you've gone out and you've looked for things and you've got involved and you've set up the club in London where you've drawn in other young people into your passions. You know, I'm j I just want to know what's next. What's happening next in your life? Because it seems like you've kind of had your career <laughs> talking to the you know, director general of the National Trust about, you know, what they should be doing more with young people. You've had such a full 18 years. What's next for you? Oh, well, I think at the moment it's just getting my A-levels done, but 
I think in the summer afterwards, I'm just planning to have a real good summer of going around the UK, just seeing wildlife if I can, because I've always wanted to go, I've always wanted to do like a road trip in all sorts of places and see various people around the UK. And that's probably my main step when it comes to just bird watching. But conservation, I think just carrying on where I am at the moment. I'm a few organisations fewer than I was a year ago. Uh, and I think that's quite good because it means I can really focus on the few that I, I am part of at the moment. And the BTO Youth Advisory Panel, we're working on such, such great projects that I'd love to be able to spend more time just focusing on them and just really, really knocking down on some of them and getting great resources available and things like that. But I think overall, I think I just want to take some, take some time just to appreciate British wildlife while I still can and while half the things aren't extinct yet. <laughs> oh, good, good. And you know, what makes my heart warm is that you're off to study geography. So oh, yeah. yeah, that was like the best choice. So good luck yeah. to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ojun. Uh, we're going to close this evening now. A, a phenomenal talk. Really amazing. Well done, Ojun. Despite all the technical difficulties, you, you held your call. Cool. That was me. I've been in a right flap. But um, thank you so much for this evening. We have really had a great evening listening to your story. And um, on the 4th of March, we've got our next online lecture. So you can go to the website now and book yourself on. That is Great Bustards Flying on the Edge of Extinction. And I'm sure Ojun will be there watching that one. Um, all that remains for me to say is have a very good evening. Um, thank you so much for coming along. Visit our website to find out more about the Wildlife in the Red exhibition. And uh, well, it's good night from me. Ojun, it's like a panel show. You can say good night too. Good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good evening. Goodbye. <laughs>